Okay, good morning, everyone. So we're just going to get started. So before we begin, I would like to remind our spectators that their microphones should be re should remain off at all times. For judges and participants, please keep your cameras on and microphones should be on mute when not speaking, please and thank you. Um, all present, session W2 of the Walker Moot Supreme Court is now in session. Welcome to the Bogorok and Associates courtroom. It is with great honor and privilege that I present Justice Corey Willard, Gowling, presiding. It is with great honor and privilege that I present Justice Emily Roy, BLG, presiding. It is with great honor and privilege that I present Justice Mike Frally, Foglers, presiding. It is with great honor and privilege that I present Justice Jeremy Ablaza, BLG, presiding. Justices of the panel, I present to you, speaking on behalf of the appellant, Ms. Armstrong, in today's matter before the court, Emma Agate and Tony Pascal. And speaking on behalf of the respondent, Dr. Ward, Jennifer Lind and Valérie Tremblay. We are here today to determine the outcome on appeal before the court on the matter between Ms. Armstrong and Dr. Ward. Both the appellant and respondent's counsel will have 30 minutes each in total, 15 minutes each council member to present their arguments to this court, including answering questions from the bench. The appellants will present their arguments first, followed by both respondents, and then a three minute rebuttal will follow by the appellant. I will signal to the court when there is five minutes left per speaker with my very fancy white piece of paper here, and then we will uh, continue forward. So that will signal that there's five minutes left per speaker. Appellants, will you be using your three minute rebuttal? Yes. Perfect, thank you very much. The court now invites counsel for the appellant to begin. Thank you. Um, good morning, Justices. My name is Emma Agate. I'm counsel for the appellant in this matter, Karen Armstrong. Our submissions today will demonstrate why the Court of Appeal in this case reached an incorrect finding that the trial judge erred in his articulation and application of the standard of care. I will be dealing with the first two issues of requisite standard of care and duty to rule out non-negligent causes. My co-counsel, Tony Pascale, will then make submissions on causation and standard of re review. Altogether, our submissions will demonstrate why the court should set aside the judgment of the Court of Appeal and restore the trial judgment with costs throughout. My submissions have three main points. One, the standard of care for medical practitioners in Canada is clear and the trial judge correctly defined the standard of care based on the evidence provided to him at trial. Two, the trial judge was not using a goal-oriented approach in defining the standard of care. It is our submission that goals and steps are purely semantics in this case. And three, the plaintiff does not have a duty to rule out all possible non-negligent causes. My first point starts with this honorable court's holding in Ternusen versus Korn regarding standard of care. It is well settled that physicians have a duty to conduct their practice in accordance with the conduct of a prudent and diligent doctor in the same circumstances. In this case, the trial judge was asked to determine what that specific conduct would entail. Based on the expert testimony of five medical professionals, including Dr. Ward himself, the trial judge appropriately concluded that identifying, protecting, and avoiding direct contact or close proximity to the ureter are essential steps a surgeon must take in conducting a laparoscopic colectomy. Our friends make reference to several cases that suggest Dr. Ward was not negligent in his actions. These cases are all distinguishable from the case at bar. Beginning on page eight and ending on page 10 of the respondent's factum, three cases are referenced demonstrating findings of non-negligence. In Mumford versus Health Sciences Center, the steps of a normal and prudent practitioner were considered, as the respondents mentioned in paragraph 17, due to the complicated nature of the patient's medical condition in that case, the physician was deemed to have acted reasonably. Now we know this differs from the case at bar where Ms. Armstrong had an anatomically normal colon and ureter and no history of relevant medical conditions which could have interfered with the surgery. 
Our friends describe Carslin versus Sutherland as analogous to the case at Barr. We respectfully disagree. Carslin is distinguishable because the expert evidence showed that that type of injury, the type of injury that occurred in that case could have happened even if a surgeon followed all of the steps to meet the standard of care. In other words, non-negligently. This differs from the case at Barr because expert evidence never demonstrated a time where a surgeon could have come within two millimeters of the ureter if they followed all of the steps required to meet the standard of care. Our friends submit that the trial judge accepted Dr. Ward took required steps to meet the standard of care and thus should have resulted in a finding of non-negligence. With respect, this is simply not true. The trial judge heard multiple expert witnesses and established steps required to meet the standard of care based off of their testimony. The trial judge explained at paragraph 109 that he was satisfied Dr. Ward took steps during this laparoscop laparoscopy to identify and protect the ureter. Took steps, not took all steps. This is because the trial judge had one more required step to identify, protect, and avoid direct contact or close proximity to the ureter. Close proximity meaning one to two millimeters. The trial judge rejected Dr. Ward's argument that he stayed at least five centimeters away from the ureter at all times. He provided two explanations as to why he rejected this argument, both completely supported by the evidence, which I will touch on later in my submissions. Moving to my second submission, the majority at the Court of Appeal found that the trial judge erred in focusing on goals rather than the means to achieve goals in performing a colectomy. Our friends submit that the use of the word goal was inappropriate as it implies a standard of perfection, which my co-counsel will address during her submissions. We respectfully submit that the trial judge's use of the word goal is purely semantics. Goals and steps can be used interchangeably when describing what one must do during surgery. Of course, there are steps a surgeon must take in a specific surgery. Completing those steps successfully can be described as a goal of the surgeon. I'll echo Justice Van Rensburg in dissent when I say that throughout the trial, staying away from the ureter was constantly described by the witnesses as a step that Dr. Ward should have taken and not his goal. This was clear. My third and final point is that the plaintiff does not have the duty to rule out all non-negligent causes. This theory would create infinite amount of duties on the plaintiff from earthquakes to muscle spasms to the hospital losing power mid-surgery. If these non-negligent theories are not argued by the defendant, surely we can assume that it is because the evidence did not support that, that they occurred. Not to mention that in medical malpractice cases, the defendant is surely in the best position to bring non-negligent theories forward, considering that the plaintiff is often sedated and often does not have the exper expertise to know what is happening regardless. At trial, the defendant's expert witnesses submitted two possible non-negligent theories as to how this, injury, how this type of injury um, could have occurred. They were both rejected by the trial judge because the literature did not support them. There was no case available to demonstrate that this ever actually happened or could have happened. And as said by Dr. Colts, the, the ligature is a device that is used all over the world and has an excellent safety record. Since these non-negligent theories were unsupported by evidence and rejected by the trial judge, the plaintiffs need not take on the burden. It has already been taken care of. As for the new non-negligent causes suggested by the majority at the Court of Appeal, as, such as structures unexpectedly moving during surgery, I would remind this court that none of these potential non-negligent causes were mentioned at trial, only on appeal. This honorable court held in Danny Look versus Ainsworth Technologies that litigants are only entitled to one bite at the cherry and are required to put their best foot forward to establish the truth of their allegations when first called upon to do so. The trial judge rightfully assumed both parties had put their best cases forward at trial 
and rightfully decided based on the evidence before him. The plaintiff certainly cannot be expected to disprove all non-negligent causes, especially ones that were not brought up at trial and only on appeal. To conclude my submissions, we respectfully submit that this court should set aside the judgment of the Court of Appeal and restore the trial judgment. The trial judge appropriately established standard of care and rejected non-negligence based on the evidence and lack thereof before him. The trial judge did not use, did not use a goal-oriented approach to define standard of care. It was well recognized throughout the trial that staying away from the ureter was a step a surgeon must take while conducting a laparoscopic colectomy, not a goal. Finally, the plaintiff should not have the duty to rule out all non-negligent causes, specifically those not supported by the evidence and not brought forth at trial. Counsel, so if, if the doctor has identified the ureter and has made best efforts to stay away from it, isn't that enough? Aren't, aren't you really advocating for a standard of perfection? Thank you um, for your question, counsel. Um, so I, I would have to say that this was never evidence that was brought forth at trial. There was never a case that could be shown where a surgeon took all of the required steps to meet the standard of care and yet still damaged the ureter. There, this was never provided in the evidence. And as mentioned by um, one of the expert witnesses for the plaintiff, if a surgeon did take all of the steps required in this surgery, um, the chance of actually injuring the ureter should be zero in his opinion. Obviously the trial judge didn't accept that evidence because he thought that would um, uphold a standard of perfection, but he did find that it would be less than 1%, especially considering that Miss um, Armstrong had an anatomically normal colon if and ureter. If she had a, um, a colon or ureter that, you know, was inflamed or there was an issue with her ureter, then that percentage would have been a little bit higher. But since it was so normal and there was absolutely nothing wrong, there is no reason why Dr. Ward couldn't have taken the steps to avoid uh, damage, damaging the ureter. So, Council, I've got a question. Council, I've got a question for you. How do you reconcile the fact that the uh, testimony of Dr. Ward at trial was that he stayed five centimeters away from it? So, sorry, Council. Um, sorry, Justice. Can you repeat the question? How do you reconcile what you just said with the fact that at trial we heard evidence? from the defendant that he stayed five centimeters away from it. Yes, so he did, yes, he said that there is no time that he was even closer than five centimeters. And of course, the trial judge rejected this argument because he found it was not possible. Um, Dr. Ward's submission was, even though he was five centimeters away with the ureter, so the, I mean, with the ligature, so the ligature is two prongs that there's an electric current running between the two of them. And he um, claimed that from five centimeters away, they were strong enough to, you know, burn the ureter from five centimeters away. But there was no evidence to suggest that this was even possible. The only instance that a burn could occur is within one to two millimeters. There has never been, um, like I said earlier, you, you know, the ligature has been used all over the world and we could not be pointed to one case where a burn would occur from over five centimeters away, which was why this um, argument was rejected by the trial judge. Subject to any further questions, um, that does conclude my submissions. So Thank you, Justices. Um, my co-counsel will now proceed with her submissions.
Good morning, Justices. My name is Tony Pascale, and I will be dealing with the second two issues on causation and standard of review. I have two points on my submission. First, that the trial judge did not err in using circumstantial evidence to inform the standard of care. And second, that the majority erred in applying a correctness standard of review rather than a reasonable standard of review. My first point follows that causation can be considered as circumstantial evidence to inform the standard of care. My friend's concerns surround the fact that the trial judge analyzed the cause of Ms. Armstrong's injuries before concluding that Dr. Ward breached the standard of care. The trial judge is to determine whether there was a breach of the standard of care before addressing causation. However, in some instances, determining what happened and how it happened could be relevant circumstantial evidence and help to determine if there was a breach in the standard of care. This means that the trial judge had to analyze what happened to figure out if Dr. Ward did the thing that he said he did not do, um, come within two millimeters of the ureter. And they had to do so on a balance of probabilities. In Kennedy versus Jakowitz, the court held that it is nonetheless open to experts and to the court to draw inferences of fact. It may be appropriate then for an expert of the court to infer from the nature of the injury what it was the surgeon did. As my co-counsel mentioned, there were two possible explanations of how Ms. Armstrong's injury occurred that the trial judge assessed. The first was that Dr. Ward breached the standard of care and brought the ligature within two millimeters of the ureter. And the second was that he did remain a safe distance. However, scarring occurred and traveled through the abdomen uh, causing damage to the ureter. These causes imply a very different explanation of Dr. Ward's actions during the surgery. Considering these potential causes, the trial judge had to rely on the outcome of the case, looking at the nature of the injury to determine whether Dr. Ward met the standard of care. These potential explanations that were brought forward by uh, the opposing side are simply theories that are not found within academic literature. With respect, the court's role is not to hypothesize about explanations not within evidence. They must consider the evidence on a balance of probabilities, which is what the trial judge did. Considering the lack of first evidence uh, from expert witnesses brought forward by my friends, the more probable explanation is that Dr. Ward came within one to two millimeters with the ligature uh, and of the ureter. The majority held that this would be an appropriate analysis of the standard of care, in this case as thermal energy was circumstantial evidence of what happened. However, the majority held that the trial judge erred in considering the standard of care leading them to state that considering causation would not have been an independent error in analyzing the case. In other words, the majority did not find issue with the fact that the trial judge considered causation in determining if the standard of care was breached. Um, in the respondent's factum, my friends write that the general test for causation is the but-for test and state that this requires the plaintiff to demonstrate that their injury would not have occurred if, a, if it were not for the negligence of the defendant. The but-for test is used to ensure that a defendant will not be liable for the plaintiff's injuries if they are due to factors unconnected to the defendant. Simply speaking, Ms. Armstrong's injury occurred during operation and as a result of the operation, which was confirmed by expert evidence. She would not have suffered this injury if it were not for the surgery, and therefore it is not from factors unconnected to the defendant. In using this logic, we can conclude that but-for Dr. Ward coming within two millimeters of the ureter the injury would not have occurred as the non-negligent explanations were rightfully rejected by the trial judge on the basis of the lack of likelihood and lack of evidence found within academic literature. I would also like to address the issue brought up at the Court of Appeal that the trial judge imposed a standard of perfection onto Dr. Ward. This is simply not true. The trial judge did not impose a standard of perfection he found that although Dr. Ward maintained following the steps required to meet the standard of care, he had not met the final step required, staying two millimeters away from the ureter, which was proven by the injury. This finding was supported wholly by the evidence supported at trial. Staying two millimeters away from the ureter was not a goal of the surgery, but an essential step, as explained by all the expert witnesses who testified at trial. Using circumstantial evidence disproves the fact that the trial judge expected perfection, the trial judge simply expected Dr. Ward to remain one to two millimeters from the ureter to protect it from injury. And based on the evidence at hand, he did not. Given the competing theories proposed at trial, uh, the trial judge could not have determined what Dr. Ward did without first considering how the injury occurred. 
Moving to my second point, uh, standard of review is a question of law reviewed for correctness, and the court must consider mixed fact and law to review for errors that are palpable and overriding. The majority erred in applying a correctness standard of review and should have implied, instead applied a reasonable standard when considering the trial judge's findings. It is important to note that a court of appeal must have substantial reasons for overturning a trial decision and must take more than a different view of evidence into account, which they did not. The majority determines that had the trial judge worded the standard of care differently, not changed the meaning, but changed the wording, the submissions would have been accepted by the court of appeal without dispute. This is not a palpable or overriding error, but merely an issue of semantics. In Cooper versus Floyd, the Court of Appeal and trial judge differ in their holding of the case because they interpret the evidence differently from each other. The court held that it is reasonable for the Court of Appeal to review, re-examine, and reweigh the evidence provided, but they must also come to a reasonable conclusion, in which case the trial judge's findings in Cooper was not unreasonable. Like this case, the majority erred in not accepting the trial judge's explanation of the standard of care as a goal. Overturning the trial judge's holdings should not occur, as I've mentioned, in the absence of palpable and overriding error. In Hassan versus Invari, Dr. Invari submitted two non-negligent explanations for the patient's injury sustained during surgery. And the Court of Appeal rejected the argument made and determined that the trial judge was entitled to reject these options based on evidence. The court in Hassan rejected these options and considered them to be speculation lacking evidence. Similar to Justice Van Rensburg's dissent in stating that there was no evidence to support Dr. Ward's non-negligence option. Having differing opinions surrounding conclusions of cases is anticipated. However, the findings of facts will remain the same. In Benham versus St. Germain, the court holds that trial judges are immersed in evidence. They hear viva voce testimony and they are familiar with the case as a whole. Their expertise in weighing large quantities of evidence and making factual findings ought to be respected. The trial judge's position is to hear these testimonies in court and determine if they are of value to the case. In a medical negligence case, medical expert expertise is crucial to coming to a result. And considering the expert witness's preference of the trial judge is imperative. The trial judge had evidence to support their holding. However, the majority did not respect these findings, which usurps the trial judge's role within the court system. As the dissent states, deference is owed to the trial judge on all findings other than questions of pure law. The trial judge did not err in the definition of standard of care as my friend suggest. Rather, the majority disagreed with the phrasing of the standard of care. This is not reason enough to overturn the trial judge's findings, nor is it reason to reweigh evidence presented at trial. Semantics does not constitute as overriding or palpable error. And therefore, the majority erred in their application of standard of, of review, and this court should overturn the decision to reflect that of the trial judge. To conclude my submissions, we respectfully submit that this court should set aside the judgment of the Court of Appeal and restore the trial judgment. The trial judge appropriately considered circumstantial evidence in informing the standard of care and in determining how Ms. Armstrong's injury occurred. The majority at the Court of Appeal erred in applying a correctness standard of review as disagreement surrounding phrasing of, of the standard of care does not constitute as an overriding or palpable error. Subject to any further questions, uh, that concludes my submission. Counselor, if I may ask a question. Um, you've, you've argued forcefully that the definition of, uh, of the standard of care uh, Goal and, and more, more importantly, this uh, semantic distinction of goal versus step, it's a subject to a palpable and overriding error standard of review. But isn't the question of what the appropriate wording should be, isn't that, a, isn't that a question of law? Isn't that therefore subject to correctness rather than a palpable and overriding error? So the issue was that the Court of Appeal just disagreed with the fact that um, the, they, they thought that the trial judge meant that they were applying uh, the goal of the surgery. They thought that they were saying that avoiding the ureter was the actual goal of the surgery. Meanwhile, it was a step. So I, I believe it was misunderstanding from the court of appeal. Um, as all of the expert witnesses state, a step is protecting and identifying the ureter. So I do not believe that 
burning the ureter is taking that step to protect the ureter. And in which case, this is an issue of semantics. So it's not an issue of, of the court of appeal disagreeing with the trial judge's explanation. They just disagree with a word that was used. They disagree with the understanding of the word that was used, which is not an overriding or palpable error. It does not change the facts of the case. So doesn't that make it a question of law and reviewable and correctness then? Forgive me, I, I you know, I, you're, you, you, uh, you counselor, of course, the expert on this case, but um, that's what I'm, I'm having trouble understanding. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Of course. Yeah. So if we're talking about articulating the standard of care um, and the, the dispute appears to be between whether it should be appropriately uh, described in the manner of goals or in the manner of steps, wouldn't that be a question of law, pure law? Sorry. Um, no, I do not believe it would be a question of pure law because they are not saying different things. The court of appeal has the same understanding as the trial judge, but they just disagree with the words used. So maybe the, the trial judge should have explained it as a step, but that is what they did. They, they assumed that that was, you know, protecting the ureter was a step. So burning it was not reaching that step. So the court of appeal did not, um, like they erred in, in applying this standard. Um, they, they went forth with saying that, um, they, they reweighed the evidence provided because they believe that there was a standard of perfection applied, but there was not, as my co-counsel mentioned, uh, the trial judge rejected the statement that 0% chance of touching the ureter. They, they said it was 1%. So um, I believe that the Court of Appeal just simply misunderstood and they applied a standard of perfection onto the trial judge themselves. So the trial judge did not necessarily mean, she did not mean, or sorry, he did not mean at all that there was a standard of perfection, but they applied a standard of perfection onto the trial judge themselves by, by not looking and saying, okay, this goal versus step issue is just a wording issue. That's not enough to overturn an, an entire judgment. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes my submissions, thank you. The court now invites counsel for the respondent to begin. Good afternoon, I suppose, justices. My name is Jennifer Lind, and I'm here this morning with my co-counsel, Valérie Tremblay. We re represent the respondent in this case, Dr. Colin Ward, a general surgeon at Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie, Ontario. Now, as we're aware, this appeal raises two key issues regarding the appropriate standard of care and the appropriate standard of review to be applied in medical negligence cases. Stem I mean, from these two main issues are four more precise questions that my co-counsel and I will be addressing today. First, whether the trial judge erred in defining the requisite standard of care in medical negligence cases in Canada. Second, whether the trial judge erred in considering causation as circumstantial evidence to inform this standard of care. Third, whether the trial judge erred by not requiring the plaintiff to rule out uh, non-negligent cases. And fourth, whether the majority of the Court of Appeal of Ontario applied the appropriate standard of review. In answering these questions, my co-counsel and I will demonstrate that the majority of the Court of Appeal of Ontario correctly reversed the trial judge's decision and did so using the appropriate standard of review. The standard of care in medical negligence cases must be determined by the behavior and actions that a prudent professional would undertake in similar circumstances, not by the results this prudent physician seeks to achieve. Further, the general rule must remain that causation should not be used to inform the standard of care. To decide otherwise would risk reversing the burden of proof and fundamentally changing the standard of care in medical negligence cases in Canada. And I'll begin by discussing the first two uh, questions what, before us. What do you mean it would reverse the burden of proof? Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So we must, in at the big, I suppose I'll, I'll start by um, discussing the, um, when it comes to causation and when it comes to proving whether or not there are um, other explanations besides negligent behavior, we have to ensure that it is the plaintiff that brings forward the proof that demonstrates that there is no other 
um, non, there, there is no other, I suppose, reason that could have resulted in um, the, the prejudice in it, or the fault in this particular case. And my, my co-counsel will discuss that further in her submissions, but we essentially want to ensure that it, it, the burden of proof remains on the plaintiff's shoulders in that regard. It's not up to the um, it's not up to the defendant to demonstrate all the reasons um, that could have, all the other reasons, I suppose, that could have explained um, the default in this scenario. And so I'll begin by discussing the requisite standard of care for medical negligence in Canada and is the role of causation in the standard of care analysis. And then my co-counsel will follow with the second two, the plaintiff's duty to rule out non-negligent causes and the appropriate standard of care to be applied in this case. Beginning first, with the utmost respect, we submit that the trial judge erred in defining and applying the standard of care for medical negligence in Canada. The correct standard of care is an obligation of means, not an obligation of results. The Supreme Court of Canada has confirmed this very principle in saint jean ville mercier where it was confirmed that what must be asked is whether the act or admission would be acceptable behavior for a reasonably prudent and diligent professional in the same circumstances. And by focusing on the result of Dr. Ward's behavior, that is on the damage caused to Ms. Armstrong's ureter, this trial judge went against established case law. And the trial judge determined that the standard of care to be applied in this case is to identify, protect, and avoid direct conduct with or close proximity to the ureter when using an energy emitting device like the ligature. Using expert testimony, he concluded that close proximity to falls within the range of one to two millimeters of the patient's ureter. This measure of close proximity is not in dispute. What is in dispute, however, is the correctness of, this applica of the application of this standard of care. And I'll elaborate on that point. In providing his reasons, the trial judge acknowledged that Dr. Ward met the standard of care as it relates to the identification and the protection of the ureter, but that because the ureter was out of camera view for a period of time, Dr. Ward must have come within two millimeters of Ms. Armstrong's ureter, thereby damaging the structure and breaching his standard of care. In other words, the trial judge made the assumption that because the ureter was not always in Dr. Ward's view, he must have harmed it. And respectfully, this is not how the standard of care should have been applied in this case. The trial judge erred by focusing on the intended goal of the surgery, that is to perform a surgery without any resulting injury, rather than on a, the steps that a diligent professional would have taken to achieve this goal. Counsel, it, it was because the doctor um, came within two centimeters of the ureter with the device, not that he couldn't see it. Isn't that what the finding was? Yes, but as the, the uh, Court of Appeal, um, as the majority in the Court of Appeal stated, that the logical, I guess, logical following of his ideas was that because there was no clear proof demonstrating that, it was that because he accepted that Dr. Ward had taken all the necessary steps. It must have been that in those moments where, where the, it was not in camera view, that that must have been when the, two, it must have been within two millimeters of the ureter. So it was by, that while there is no proof from that exact incident, it was because it was assumed that when the ureter was out of Dr. Ward's view, that that's when the incident must have occurred. But, but didn't the physician say that he never got closer than five centimeters from the ureter and that wasn't accepted by the trial judge? He didn't believe that based on the fact that this could only have happened, um, ruling out any other causes, if you got within two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, from the actual surgery itself, of course, Dr. Ward has no um, proof in, in those moments to demonstrate at what points he was or was not within. Of course, that was his submission that he believes he was for five centimeters away. And yes, the, the evidence states that in order to have caused the damage to the ureter, it must have been within that five, or sorry, within that two millimeter range. Um, and of course, the, the evidence is simply not there to, to demonstrate truly either way beyond conclusions based on, on what, we, what we know to be the case in, in these situations. Thank you. And, while our friends contend that the distinction between steps and goals in a surgery is one of semantics, and in particular in this case, we must respectfully disagree. In fact, we contend that the main source of the trial judge's error comes from the importance placed on the result of the surgery itself, and more precisely, the importance placed on the injury to Ms. Armstrong's left ureter and the subsequent damage caused to her left kidney. 
And if a judge uses the goal of avoiding injury to define the standard of care, this amounts more to absolute liability and is therefore not the correct measure of liability in medical negligence cases. And on this first point, I will conclude that by stating that it is the majority's application of the standard of, I must conclude by stating that it is the majority's um, application of the standard of care that must be upheld. As the majority has recognized, the proper articulation of the standard of care in this case would be that a prudent surgeon would take the step of not knowingly, intentionally, and unnecessarily deploying the ligature within two millimeters of the ureter or any collateral tissues for that matter. And this is precisely what Dr. Ward did as the trial judge himself recognized. And it's this point that we'd like to make very clear and, and where the question of semantics really comes in. It goes beyond wording the standard of care that we're focusing on here. What's important is that the surgeon in, a, in this case took the appropriate steps to do what they could not to come within two millimeters. Whereas in the trial judge, the trial judge's articulation of the standard of care, it would imply absolute liability, whether or not the surgeon intentionally, unintentionally, or unnecessarily brought the ligature within two millimeters. And to further, the Canadian case law rejects the standard of perfection in medical negligence cases, and this was well established in Ternus and that the standard of care expected of a physician is a duty to conduct their practice in accordance with the conduct of a prudent and diligent doctor in the same circumstances. And as our friends have established, there was detailed evidence at trial about the steps that a prudent surgeon would take during a colectomy. Put simply, a prudent surgeon will identify the ureter for, through vermiculation and move it away from the colon before proceeding with the procedure, continuously rechecking the location of the ureter by periodically repeating the vermiculation. And the surgeon will also try to avoid bringing the ligature within an unsafe proximity to the other tissues. And it must be reiterated that Dr. Ward testified that he took these steps and the trial judge accepted that he did. The analysis of the standard of care should have stopped there. Instead, despite having found that Dr. Ward took the steps that a reasonably prudent surgeon would have, the trial judge predicated his finding of liability on Dr. Ward's failure to achieve the goal of a perfect injury-free surgery. And with respect, this approach is, is flawed and inconsistent with established case law. And Canadian courts have consistently refused to define the standard of care in medical negligence cases in such a way so as to focus on the goal or the result of the procedure, rather than on the actions and on the behavior of the physician. And there are three key examples that we've, we've pulled and I'll begin with Mumford versus Health Science Center. And this case was distinguished by my friends, but allow me to explain why it is applicable. In this case, a 17 month year old plaintiff suffered cardiac arrest during an operation that was performed by the defendant physician. The child had suffered permanent and severe disabilities leading to a negligent suit against the hospital in question and its staff. When it came to defining the standard of care, the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench confirmed that the standard of care imposed on a medical practitioner is not in fact one of perfection and must therefore focus on the behavior of the practitioner rather than the result of the medical procedure that was performed. And yes, indeed, the medical condition in this case was complicated, but this the surgeon took the steps that a prudent practitioner of the same experience would have. And this is relevant because just like the physician did in Mumford, Dr. Ward took all the reasonable steps that a prudent physician would have by isolating the ureter and continuously confirming its safe distance from other tissues. Another case is worth mentioning as well, Carlson v. Sutherland. Again, it was distinguished, but it is actually analogous to the present case at bar. So this in case involved a disectomy where during one part of the surgery, the surgeon could not see the area where he had placed his instruments and relied on his sense of touch and feel to guide him. He went too far and injured the blood vessels, but just like Mumford and Pinder, the finding of little liability was set aside because the trial judge held the physician to a standard that amounted to a guarantee, and this standard has never and should never be the law. And moving now to the question of causation. We contend that the trial judge erred by combining the standard of care analysis with the causation analysis in this case. It is well established that a trial judge must determine whether the defendant has breached the standard of care before turning towards the issue of causation. We submit that the trial judge engaged in circular reasoning and rendered the causation inquiry ineffective by defining the standard of care in a manner that implied absolute liability should any injury occur during Ms. Armstrong's surgery. As this honorable court is well aware, the general test for causation is the but-for test requiring the plaintiff to demonstrate that their injury would not have occurred if it had not been for the negligence of the defendant. 
but this test would really truly serve no meaningful purpose if causing an injury were to imply automatically that there was failure to meet the standard of care. And having included that requirement in the standard of care, the trial judge erred because it implies liability no matter what, should there be any injury that occurs. And we contend that causation should only be used in circumstance, as circumstantial evidence to inform the standard of care in very exceptional circumstances. And by this, we mean that it should only be used when the nature of the injury is truly relevant to what happened in a medical procedure. And this is not the case with Ms. Armstrong's surgery, because unlike in Mariniolo and, Gr and Grass, where the trial judge had to analyze how the injuries of the plaintiffs occurred out of necessity, the trial judge in our case had, had to focus on the injury because of his misidentification of the standard of care. So these are different bases upon which they made those, those conclusions. And therefore, by concluding that the standard must, in, must include avoiding direct contact with or close proximity to the ureter when using an energy emitting device like the ligature, the trial judge had put himself in a position where he had to consider whether Dr. Ward brought the tool within uh, two millimeters of Mr. Armstrong's ureter in order to make a determination regarding um, a breach of the standard of care. And we recognize that under the standard of care that was articulated by the trial judge, it would not have necessarily been an error to consider the injury before determining that there was a breach. However, the standard was incorrect and the facts before us do not amount to an exceptional circumstance where causation should be considered as circumstantial evidence, but it goes beyond the question of how the, the standard of care was articulated and it goes beyond, wor beyond words and semantics. And for all these yep, reasons, yep. Counsel, I've, I've got a question for you. So again, let's go back to the evidence of your client. And he said that he did not come within five centimeters of the ureter. Um, and, and the judge was in a position where the defendant is hiding and saying, well, it's the plaintiff's obligation to, to, prove, uh, to prove causation on the blood four test. So is it not appropriate to then, as you describe in exceptional circumstances, to go back and see what the cause of the injury was and then try to retrace where that uh, cause could have occurred? and whether or not it had anything to do with your client? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. And this, in, in a, I suppose in the articulation of the standard of care that the trial judge had made, that would, that would be the correct way to do it. However, it should have been at the, the causation step because we are, we're talking about first what the standard of care was and whether it was breached and then moving to, to the question of whether that breach of the standard of care resulted in the injury, the plaintiff's injury. So I would submit that I believe it is a very relevant question, but it's simply misplaced in, in, the, fact, in the case at bar because the standard of care should not have had that question of distance from the ureter. It should have only been whether or not Dr. Ward took the necessary steps to identify and protect the ureter and stayed away from it to the best of his ability, taking continuously checking where it was, which he did, and which the trial judge um, recognized that he did. And then after having established, well, in this case, it would have been established he did not breach standard of care and we wouldn't have moved forward. But um, yeah, it would, it, they're just two separate steps and it was misplaced. And I, I'll just conclude briefly um, that for all these reasons, we must conclude that the requisite standard of care and medical negligence is an obligation of means, not an obligation of results, and only in rare and exceptional circumstances can causation be used as circumstantial evidence to inform the standard of care. And I'll now yield my time to my co-counsel to speak to the remaining issues. Good afternoon, Justices. Um, I will be addressing the two remaining issues the first regarding the standard of care and the inference of negligence, and the second with respect to the appropriate standard of review. First, we respectfully submit that the majority did not err when stating that the plaintiff has a duty to rule out non-negligent causes when invoking that negligence is the only explanation possible for the nature of the injury suffered. The majority of the Court of Appeal held that where a plaintiff argues that negligence can only be the sole explanation for the wrong suffered, the plaintiff must be able to demonstrate that it is indeed the one and only explanation by striking out all other non-negligent explanations. The statement relates to the doctrine of res ipsa locutor. This is the principle that the occurrence of an accident implies negligence. The doctrine allows the plaintiff to meet their burden of proof with circumstantial evidence by proving that the harm could not ordinarily have occurred without negligence, as there are no other plausible explanations. When invoking the doctrine of res ipsa locutor, 
it does not affect the burden of proof as it does not shift to the defendant. As stated in Fisher v. Waller by the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench, which we quote in paragraph 26 of our factum, the doctrine is applicable where the thing that has caused the harm in question is within the control of the defendant and could not have been caused without negligence. In this case, the plaintiff had suffered total loss of vision in one eye after the globe of the eye was perforated by the needle used to administer a local anesthetic block prior to a cataract surgery. The plaintiff had failed to show that the perforation injury would not have occurred without negligence, and the evidence established that the injury could occur without negligence. In the present case, the plaintiff did not establish that the injury could not occur without negligence. The Supreme Court of Canada concluded in Fontaine v. British Columbia official administrator that this doctrine should be treated as expired and should no longer be used as a separate component in a negligent action, as it is nothing more than an attempt to deal with circumstantial evidence. Even though this doctrine is to be considered expired, the necessity for a plaintiff to establish negligence by demonstrating that negligence is the only probable and rational explanation still stands. However, it is limited to situations where the facts permit inference of negligence when they show that there would be no other explanation for the harm committed. We submit that the res ipsa loquitur principle does not apply to the facts in this case. Please allow me to elaborate. In this case, the plaintiff was unable to infer negligence due to the misconception of the standard of care. In the appeal decision, the majority correctly assessed the plaintiff's claim of circumstantial evidence of negligence. Justice Pacioso explains at paragraph 64 how given the trial judge's misconception of the standard of care, he had to resolve what happened, so whether the ligature was deployed within two millimeters of the ureter, based on the evidence accepted by the trial judge. When applying this doctrine to the case at bar, the plaintiff would still have the burden of proving that the harm could not have happened without negligence on the part of Dr. Ward. This is supported in Hassan v. Anvari, mentioned at paragraph 28 of our factum. This case comes in 2003, five years after the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Fontaine. In that case, the judge had concluded that regardless of the abolition of the res ipsa loquitur doctrine, the burden of proof is still on the plaintiff to prove that negligence is the only probable cause of harm committed by the defendant. In that case, the surgeon had performed an operation to repair the patient's hiatus hernia and cut out her aorta. The difference with this case and the present case is that there is sufficient evidence to allow inference of negligence. In Hessen, evidence presented to the trial judge contradicted the explanations presented by the defendant. As my colleague mentioned, the present case does not fall into this, this exceptional category. When applying the proper standard of care, the evidence confirms that Dr. Ward took all the necessary precautions required. My friends have submitted that it would be a waste of time for the plaintiff to bring forth every possible non-negligent cause. However, as Hassan clearly demonstrates, the onus does not fall on the defendant to rule out non-negligent causes when the plaintiff argues that negligence alone could have caused the harm in question. The plaintiff's argument must be supported by an explanation as to why negligence is the only explanation possible. Canadian case law clearly shows that the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to establish presence of negligence before the, def the defendant attempts to demonstrate in what way his actions do not constitute negligence. Even if this burden of proof can be satisfied by circumstantial evidence, the plaintiff must still be able to show that only the def the defendant's negligence could have caused the harm in question. It is only when negligence has been established that the, def the defendant will raise a defense in which he will present an alternative explanation. In the present case, the appellant did not offer evidence that would support this burden. More evidence than what was presented in the expert's testimonies is required to allow for the inference of negligence. In short, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to show that the harm suffered could have only been caused by negligence, and therefore it requires that she demonstrate that any other non-negligent cause could have been possible. Moreover, in this case, the plaintiff was unable to prove any inference of negligence, in addition to the misapplication of the standard of care. Thus, the Court of Appeal did not err in its commentary on the plaintiff's duty to show that negligence was the only explanation. 
Moving on to the second issue at bar, we submit that the Court of Appeal did not err in applying the standard of review of correctness and not that of reasonableness. Due to the important question of law that arose from the trial judge's decision. As the trial judge erred in his definition of proper standard of care, this amounts to a question of law. In cases such as this, the trial judge is not entitled to the same level of deference on a question of law on appeal. This was confirmed in Houston v. Nicolaisen, a Supreme Court of Canada decision, which we cite at paragraph 30 in our factum. The Supreme Court confirmed that the appellant court is free to replace the opinion of the trial judge with its own, and thus the standard of review applicable is, in this case, is that of correctness. In addition to this question of law regarding the applicable standard of care, a mixed question of fact and law is also present in the case at bar. In Houston, again, the Supreme Court concluded that the, palpable, the standard of palpable and overriding error also applies to the inferences of fact drawn by the trial judge. Questions of mixed fact and law, which are findings of negligence, should also be accorded with great deference, except those which amount to an incorrect statement of the legal standard. As there is a palpable overriding error in the definition of the standard of care, we respectfully submit that this issue should not be treated with deference. The majority in the appeal decision not only looked at the articulation of the standard of care, but also at the reasoning behind the trial judge's conclusion of negligence. As the Court of Appeal concluded, it is generally an error of law to use outcomes as goals as the standard of care. Thus, the trial judge erred when defining the standard of care based on the goal and not defining how a prudent surgeon would act to achieve that specific goal. In sum, the Court of Appeal did not err in applying the standard of review of correctness. In conclusion, we submit that the trial judge erred in defining the standard of care for medical negligence as the correct standard of care in these cases is an obligation of means, not an obligation of results. Canadian case law rejects the standard of perfection in medical negligent cases. The trial judge's reasons would push Canadian case law in another direction as it would impose upon professionals the obligation to conduct perfect surgeries in all circumstances. The trial judge also erred in concluding that the standard of care was breached. The rest ipsa loquitur doctrine does not apply to the facts of this case, but if applied, the burden of proof is still on the plaintiff to demonstrate that negligence is the only rational explanation possible, which was not met in this case. Finally, Yes. It's not, they're not advocating for a uh, perfection standard, are they? They're basically saying stay two millimeters away from or two centimeters away from the ureter. Isn't that all they're saying here? It's not about perfection. That's about you got one thing, you can see where it is. You want to make sure you're away from it by two centimeters. Do that. That's the standard. You keep all of your electrical devices more than two centimeters away from the ureter. Isn't that an appropriate? A measure of the standard and then ultimately have you done it or not done? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're saying is that if we add the two millimeters distance in the standard of care, it would mean that we, we're taking away from the fact the standard of care is basically to do every single possible measure to protect the ureter. Although the two millimeters does is included in the precautions you can take to stay away from the ureter, it should not be in itself in the standard of care definition. Um, as the doctor has shown, he had taken every single step possible as a reasonable surgeon would have to stay away from the ureter. So that, that's what we submit. But, but isn't the point that clearly, despite the best efforts of the doctor to stay two centimeters away, uh, the injury must have been caused by getting too close because, in fact, that was the only rational basis in the evidence to explain why it is that that burn occurred. Yes. Um, I, yes, this question is um, pertinent, but we still do submit that the two millimeters should not be included into the standard of care. Um, if we did include it, and every time something would happen where a non-negligent factor would 
would um, make the surgeon come into contact with the two millimeters of the ureter, then we would be imposing a standard of perfection, limiting any other non-negligent um, reasoning. But, but Council, let me take it from there. Um, when, when you say the non-negligent factor, what, what are we referring to in this case? It, it's clear in this case that it's the physician who clipped the ureter. So what's, what, what's the non-negligent factor you're referring to? Um, so any non-negligent factor that could have been um, uh, invoked could have been anything from like a tremor or um, something to that matter. Uh, there's nothing in the evidence that proves that negligence is the one and only explanation for him coming into close proximity to the ureter, as there's no evidence showing that he actually did come into the two millimeter range. Um, as Dr. Ward had submitted, he believes that he stayed um, five centimeters away and the negligence was inferred by the fact that there was indeed damage caused to um, the appellant's ureter. If I may ask, Ms. Tremblay, um, so what, what were the non-negligent explanations preferred by Dr. Ward's counsel at trial? Um, no, I don't believe any non-negligent um, factors were presented apart from uh, what was submitted by one of the experts, given that a tremor could have caused this also. Um, we submit that the, um, the burden is on the plaintiff to rule out all the non-negligent causes. And as a defendant, we um, submit that he indeed did take all the precautions to ensure that he um, met the standard of care um, without having to rule out all the other non-negligent possibilities that could have occurred. Well, wouldn't that vastly increase the time and complexity of a trial if, if I have to, if I'm a plaintiff lawyer and I have to try and um, also put in evidence about, well, there were no earthquakes at the time. There was no, no weather that would have struck the, struck the hospital and shut off the power. You know, I mean, at, at what point does the, does the balance swing too far? If, if the burden is so onerous on the plaintiff, then arguably there's always, a, there's always an option to overturn the, uh, the, the finding of negligence, no? So the necessity to rule out on not all non-negligent causes um, would be within reason also. So I don't see the point in having to rule out, well, there was no earthquake or um, there was no power outage. It all depends on the facts present in the case, um, depending on who does the surgeon is and what his um, um, like previous experiences are. Is he an expert? Is he uh, a new surgeon? Um, what was happening in the surgery room at that moment, uh, who the who the, the plaintiff would be. Um, I don't think it would be necessary to go all the way into um, the earthquakes and all of those um, far-fetched non-negligent situations. Um, so, you. it's, you're welcome. Um, so it's for all these reasons that we request that the Court of Appeal of Ontario's majority decision be confirmed and that the appellant's action be dismissed with costs awarded to the respondent. That concludes my submissions. Thank you. The court now invites counsel for the appellant to begin their optional three minute rebuttal. Thank you, justices. First, I would like to point out that if the court of appeal decision is upheld, I would like the court to imagine what a dangerous precedent this would set. Doctors arguing they tried their best to avoid damage would be good enough to deem them non-negligent. Plaintiffs are already at a disadvantage in medical malpractice cases as it is. Imagine how hard it would be for them to prove negligence after such a holding. Second, we respectfully submit there is no reverse onus 
reverse onus doesn't happen in medical in medical negligence uh, cases, not ever, not even when the trial judge chooses to assess circumstantial evidence. Res ispa locter, of course, does not apply to this case. As my friends mentioned, it is bad law since this honorable court deemed it so in Fontaine in 1998. Um, what this court had to say in regards to circumstantial evidence and reverse onus is that the plaintiff obviously does have the burden to prove negligence. They must bring forward proof and the defendant must then present evidence uh, negating the plaintiff's evidence. Then based on the available direct and the circumstantial evidence, the trial judge has the discretion to decide whether the defendant's evidence actually does negate the plaintiff's. Um, simply put, in the case at bar, the trial judge did not find that it did, and he had every authority to make this finding. Um, finally, with respect to semantics, steps, goals, outcomes aside, no one ever submitted that not damaging the ureter was the outcome of a laparoscopic colectomy. Of course, that's not the outcome. Um, the outcome was to remove the colon. Uh, protecting the ureter was just a step along the way. Um, and finally, as uh, my friends conceded, there's no point in bringing up evidence of like an earthquake as it's not relevant and it has to be like within uh, reason. So they did mention a tremor. This was never brought up at trial, never. So again, this is um, a not a relevant thing to bring up just as the same way the earthquake would have been. And there was no evidence supporting any tremor as well. So I'd say um, that it is just as unreasonable for the plaintiff to uh, disprove it as it would be an earthquake. Um, and that that concludes uh, my rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, congratulations, everyone. This concludes the matter of Armstrong v. Ward. So if you would like to stay, I would invite everyone to uh, remain for the next session, which will begin at 1 p.m. If not, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Courtney.